Welcome to Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast. One, two, one, two. I'm Jeffrey McGuire. Most people call me Jam. And this is where we celebrate the Typo3 community, sharing your stories, talking about your projects, and the difference you make in, around, and with Typo3 CMS. This is indeed Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast. My guest today is Thomas Nora Mickelson. You can call him Thomas Nora. You can call him Thomas Mickelson. You can probably even call him Thomas Nora Mickelson. Just don't call him late for his golf game. Thomas and I talked about a lot of things today, including the fact that Thomas has used Typo3 every day of his life since 2004, his difficulty in deciding what his favorite feature might be and if that's even important. We talk about his professional life, his open source life, maintaining the Typo3 crawler extension, and he has a nice metaphor for that, saying, I didn't give birth to the child, but I am nurturing it now. There's a nice bit about refactoring, talking about the advantage of smaller code bases supporting innovation, and we do touch a little bit on European weather, bicycling, golf, and what would a 2020 podcast be without some pandemic and lockdown humor. I hope you enjoy this episode. You have the window open for proper COVID ventilation? I was wondering, because you're wearing a scarf. Uh, it's, I'm easily cold, so uh-huh. I'm, I'm more that kind of person. Huh. <laughs> so it's a better are safe. You, are you really Danish? Yeah, I'm originally from Denmark. Yeah, that's correct. How are you doing? Uh, I'm good, thanks. Um, of course, this, I would not call it a new situation anymore, but the situation with their remote is of course, changed a lot, but mm. uh, for, for me personally, it's for the better <laughs> because I've been actually been dreamt about doing remote for quite a while. So uh-huh. it's, a good, it's a good test for me to see if it actually is something that fits me. Uh, and I must say that it, it suits me quite well. Yeah. Um, the, I Even though I only have to travel 11 kilometers to get to the office, I st- it still costs me two hours a day. <gasps> yeah. Um, and that's and how, more, yeah. How do you how do you usually travel that, <clears throat> or how yep. did you used to travel that? Uh, with the with with the train. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I went to the train station with bike, and then to the train, and then. But every time you have a small uh, buffer, <laughs> it costs time. So yeah. ideally, I could do it from door to door in fifty minutes when I use the public transportations. If I go by car, in best case, I could do it in 25, but worst case is over an hour. And by bike, I could do it in probably 45 minutes. So it's in that range. Of, um, right, right. So 45 right. minutes of 90 minutes of biking every day is incredibly healthy. But, you know, if yeah. you're susceptible to getting cold, um, it's suboptimal in the, in the wintertime, eh? Yeah, but but that's not the reason. Uh, I just find it uh, annoying, so to speak, to to shower two times a day. The the yeah. facilities in the office are there. Uh, we have great showers. We have a big uh, uh, parking area for our bikes. Everything is actually possible. Um, but yeah, so far I haven't done it that much. I have done mm-hmm. it, but, but not that much. Mm. And uh, right now I choose to. Do it like that, that I have one hour extra for sleep and one hour extra for sport. Nice. So it's 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 a win for me. That sounds like a good combination. Okay. I've um I've been working remote effectively since before there was a word for it. I've been working remote since 2000. Um, okay. And I used to get, um, when I was working in the film industry, I would get video cassettes and scripts delivered and floppy disks delivered by a courier. And then I would do the work I had to do on them. And then I would call the courier and they would come and pick them up. (laughs) I see. So that was back then when freelancing was really freelancing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's cool. So, so this all kind of fits perfectly though. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and and what you do professionally yeah uh i i don't know what to say about myself but i'll i'll give it a go uh 
my name Thomas, you know that already. Um, and I am originally from Denmark. We established that at two. I'm 40 years old, so it gives me a little experience. Um, I have been working professionally as a software developer since 2004. So that's also the time where I started with Type of Free. Uh huh. Uh, so I'm one of the older guys, so to speak. Uh, but still, I sometimes feel lacking of there's really expert level, so to speak, because the the task you do is not consistently the same challenging. And if you're not constantly get challenged, you don't get uh, developed as a person, as a developer, the same way as you would if you always get challenged. I have mm. had some really challenging tasks and etc. But sometimes you feel like you're just standing still and not developing yourself. So from the year perspective, if you look at it like that, I should be uh, a kick-ass developer. <laughs> I think I am in some case, uh, cases too. But but yeah, it's, it still feels like something is, is missing. But I think it's the classic imposter syndrome that you're... It's very common in our industry. Yeah. And... But when you have a when you have a when you have a you know whatever you want to call it when you have a large software package like typo 3 mm -hmm. um you, there are very few people who can know everything about it and everyone has some specialties right so sure. i know that you've got some particular things that you focused on over the years and then there's there are easily going to be places that you don't know so much about that you could figure out if you had to probably most likely i would expect that or, and not least important, I would know whom to ask. Right. And that's, yeah. that's, that's when we can talk about open source community being so valuable. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, besides from that, professionally, uh, I, um, I do PHP development logically because I do uh, type of free. Uh, I'm into DevOps and continuous integration and delivery. So to automate things because I'm a lazy developer. I did a talk some years ago, I think four or five years ago, and I had a slide that even though I run, even though I run marathons, I consider myself lazy. And people were just like, how can that be? How can you compare these two things? You cannot be lazy and run a marathon at the same time. But things I should do more than once, I try to automate. Uh-huh. So how do you get how do you automate the marathon? That I haven't succeeded yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. There's, um... Of course, because we're because we're talking about um, technology, there's an XKCD comic about the number of times you need to do something versus the amount of time it takes to do it versus the amount of time it takes to automate it and whether it's worth doing or not and how much of your life it, it eats. Yeah, I have I've seen that uh, too. I think. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's 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 a that's a good point. But I I tend to do it probably too fast sometimes. Uh -huh. Probably too fast because I'm really annoyed when I have to do it too often. Sure. But yeah. But, yeah. That's, a, but that's, actually a, that's actually a really healthy trait. Um, um, and, and DevOps is kind of an expression of that as a cultural tendency in, in mm -hmm. among developers, right? And the automation, frankly, removes human error. As long as the things that you automate are automated the right way, then it's actually safer, right? And the pitch that we always give people is, you know, now you can get on with the interesting parts of your job instead of the parts that you risk screwing up because you're you're bored. Correct. Yeah. That's that's also my part of my philosophy. Because I, I want to do new stuff. I don't want to do the same stuff I know already how to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your what's your job and your job title and what do you do on a daily basis? Uh, my job title is developer. We don't have titles in our companies. We have roles. So uh, I'm a developer. What company is that? Uh, I am uh, by AOE, G-A-M-B-H, what's it called? AOE. Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. Uh, I just have to mention the, the last part of the company, then I switch automatically to German, even though I don't. I'm not German, but yeah, okay. Um, but I'm uh, at AOE since 2013 uh, because they asked me to, and then I joined. <laughs> it was actually that simple. I, I do a type of free development, 90% of my time, mostly 
the last three years, I do updates, type three updates. I'm on a pretty big client of ours, which have a type of free instance that needs a lot of maintenance. So I don't do much features, I do more maintenance. So making mm. sure that it's compatible with the next version and the next version and the next version so that we can update. So I'm not really getting into new features and stuff like that. So that's also one of the reasons why I say that sometimes I feel like I'm not using my potential completely. Uh -huh. I'm not, I'm not uh, getting these challenging tasks because replacing class A with class B, a lot of people can do, but it's something okay. we, can, we can automate. And it's right. something we are trying to improve so that we can do it better and faster and make room for other tasks. Right, and uh, the more systematic and the more consistent your teams are with how which which extensions they use and how they're configured, the easier it is for the whole company to do a better job for the clients over time, right? Because then eventually you can automate how you use this and how you built that, and that you've, if you've if you've implemented it on ten projects, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that many type of free projects anymore, but we still have a few pretty big ones. Mm. So yeah. How yes. long have you been in? How long have you been in Germany? Since two thousand thirteen, I moved to Germany to join AOE back then, mm. uh, and it's actually it's actually quite a fun story because I started working for the type of free community actively around two thousand twelve, end two thousand twelve, and then there was a code sprint in two thousand thirteen, and roughly at the same time, I saw online on Twitter that AOE was looking for employees. So I replied, how do you feel about employees, foreign employees that don't speak German? No problem, if your English is good, which I consider, then um, you can join us, or you can apply at least. <laughs> uh, then I did, and they asked me for a code test, like a lot of companies do when they hire new people they don't know that well. Um, and I handle in the, the code and I got feedback and yeah, they would like me to do uh, uh, changes and I wrote them, hey, sorry, I can't do that right now. I'm on a way to a code sprint, but I'll take care of it when I get back home. And then I realized I was on my way to AOE for a code sprint. <laughs> so in the evening, the first day I was in the office of AOE, I got an email from their CEO, Kian. Uh, he was back then in the San Francisco to build up the San Francisco office. And I got the email from him just to let you know, we want to offer you the job. We just want to see how fast you could adapt the changes. And that email I got as sitting in the AOE office. <laughs> and then the next day I had my short interview uh, with their CTO and uh, another developer. And yeah, then three months later, I started working for AOE. Nice. And um, so if being remote works out for you, are you going to move back to Denmark or are you going to stay in Germany? Um, that's still up for discussion with my girlfriend. <laughs> uh -huh. No, uh, I, I, I really miss Denmark once in a while. I, I mm -hmm. really like the nature. I like, in Denmark, you can basically not live there without being close to the sea. And mm -hmm. that I really love, to be honest. Sure, uh, and you're in you're in Mainz right now, which is pretty far away from the ocean. Correct. I th we we talked about it yesterday in our daily, and I think we estimated roughly 450 kilometers to the coast uh, left of Amsterdam. Mm. That's the shortest distance I can get to the sea, I think. Aha. Uh -huh. But we we're, we're not completely sure, but that's in in around that numbers. Mm. And in Denmark, you cannot be more than 50 kilometers from the sea, regardless right. of where you are. Right. So, exactly. Uh, so of course it's it's something we talk about. Uh, my girlfriend is just not really into. She don't know job wise and etc. She's a, she's a banker, and of course the systems are different. She speaks uh -huh. she speaks Danish, uh, but she's German. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's still something we talk about once in a while. That but, uh, Frankfurt area is probably a better place for bankers overall. There's a lot of banks there, eh? Uh, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so you said you picked up Typo 3 in 2004, right? Correct. What version did you first touch? That must be around 
3.4, 3.6, something like mm. that. So it's 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 a few versions back then. How did you encounter it? How did it how did it come into your your into your life, or or how did you come to its life? That's actually a, also a fun story, if I may say myself. It started with a Joomla project. Uh, okay. Uh, the client contacted us. Uh, I was self-employed back then. The client contacted me and asked for a Joomla project, and I. I had no experience with Joomla, type of free or whatsoever, but I couldn't really get my head around Joomla back then. And then I looked for alternatives and see if I could pitch that as a project for the client instead. And I ended up selling them uh, a type of free solution instead. Yeah. So my very first type of free solution I sold was for 15,000 euros. And I had zero experience back then but I still managed to sell it uh, because I I sort of felt like I was on my right spot quite fast. Uh-huh. Uh, so what convinced you to offer them Typo3? Uh, it's, it's a few years ago, so I might not be really on that edge anymore, what it is, but I, I found uh, the possibilities on how to extend the system was good because they had, of course, a lot of basic CMS that every CMS system could could handle. Yep. But um, but I found their their extensibility over the extensions are easier in there than in in Joomla back then. Right, um, and um, in my experience, um, the style of Joomla, at least, um, I wasn't aware of Joomla that far back, and was it still Mambo then, or had they? I don't even know when the split was anymore. But um, no clue. the Joomla, the Joomla style seems to be very large, multifunctional extensions. Where here's an entire solution for a kind of business or something, and okay. then, and then it, it becomes uh, quite hard to sort of swap out a piece or add another extension if somebody's decided to do it in a different way. And I like the systems like Typo Three that provide standardized, granular extension opportunities. Yeah, yeah. What do you remember about Typo 3 3? And and would you how could you even would you compare it to Typo 3 10 now? No, so of course there are comparisons to be made because there are things that didn't change. Mm. But but one of the first first things I remember back then and some things that I still value is the page tree, the page module. It's it's actually pretty simple, straightforward, but it's something you know from other structures like file structures. Yep. So you can build your navigation in a logic way that you can see in your backend that represent directly more or less in the front end. Of course, you can make a hide and menu and all these kind of things, but, but that was one of the things that I found the easiest to start with. And yeah. And the fact that I could change layouts so that not every page had the same layout. Mm. Without rewriting my complete design, complete design back then, Tim blah, blah, blah was the the big, the thick big thing, and it was so like uh, click and point to 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 map your your HTML. So that was back then. It was quite easy, to, yeah, to get started. Of course, Type of Free still get a lot of complaints about their their the hurdle to get started with Type of Free is is not that easy, but it also comes to your perspective on how you see things because sure. uh, I'm one kind of person. I learn in one way. You are a different mm. kind of person. You probably learn in a different way. Uh, and yeah. and I, I totally accept the premise that type of free could be difficult for a lot of people to, as a starter. Luckily, the community is on that and trying to, to improve that so we can have more people joining also with less technical skills. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or different technical skills. It doesn't need to be less technical skills. It can just be different technical skills. I, I find it found it quite easy to get started back then. Yeah, the page tree concept is one of the strong differentiators for me, and it's such. It looks very simple, and it has quite a lot to it um, that I that I think is really valuable for real real projects in the world. It seems to me that Typo three is very very good for 
very large information heavy sites. So that's a really typical corporate use case. Um, mm -hmm. I need to put out a lot of information and I need to keep track of it. And if I have a, a visual hierarchy set up for me, just mentally like a file system, that's easier to take care of. And I find it incredibly convenient that I can build a page structure and start to put in content. And it doesn't matter that my front end system is not set up or that it doesn't even exist yet because the managing content part works. And then it's such a nice set of shortcuts. If you want it to, it'll define your menus for you. It'll define the navigation for you. It'll define multi-page URL structures for you all in that tree. And mm -hmm. um, as far as I can observe, people who work as content authors and editors, you know, they also recognize that instantly. And it makes it pretty easy for them to jump in and sort of keep track of where they are in their day-to-day -day yeah. work. I really like that. The thing about Typo3 being complex to approach or or you know with a steep learning curve i think any system of a given complexity sort of can't be easy by definition right but um yeah. i i am involved in um several different projects uh personally and professionally and i was thinking about this particular aspect for a long time and someone on my team was installing typo3 a couple of years ago and came across something strange in the installation process. And it's not its not the usual one that freaks people out that like a successful installation is when it shows you the error message at the end, right? Uh, which is funny enough, but um, you know, there's like, there's some point in the installation process where um, at least at the time you have to know to reload a page, but there's no instruction to do it. And there's something, something in the middle there. And we, we were thinking about filing a bug or trying to refine the process. And I brought it up, um, I brought it up with uh, with a, a much more experienced Typo3 uh, community member than me. And, and they told me, hey, why are you installing this yourself? Typo3 is a professional system for professionals. You hire someone to help you do Typo3, right? So this, um, it's really, really in interesting. And that, that helped me define my my vision of of who the typo three community is and i see it as a as a community of professionals um you know doing delivering client work and then if and then once i re recognize that this is professionals doing client work then it's pretty clear to see that what the what the core delivers is so much of what you need to do a typical web agency client project and Sure, you can do fancy, crazy stuff, and sure, it's flexible and extensible, but there's this really solid toolkit in the middle to get big information-rich sites out. I, and I, I find that, you know, that's a really, really strong value proposition. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. The biggest uh, project I've done so far was the Sony uh, Places Network. Mm -hmm. It's not that small, <laughs> uh, but that was, uh, that was a setup with, I think, around 99 languages wow nice uh but in multi-tree so when we we had a, a, the default uh, page and every time we published a new language we copied the tree because of course you cannot have a single page tree with uh, 99 overlays that would not be possible right <laughs> so but it was uh, quite good so every uh, language, for instance, uh, Mexico, of course, had Mexico English and Mexico Spanish. Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if the same go for Brazil, etc. So the small pages were uh, made with overlays and the rest was single tree or multi tree, so to speak. But it was quite a big setup. And I remember one time we launched, I think it was 20 languages at one go. And that was uh, quite interesting. Yeah. It's also pretty impressive that, that you can have sites that are that big and that complex and it still remains performant and the, you, the, the, the user interface still supports authors and translators and everybody getting their job done in a pretty clear way. Yeah. It was actually the, the requirements for the server itself. It, it ran back then on 6.2. That was the first project I did on 6.2 and it was even the, the client was that uh, upfront and upstream that we launched with the release candidate too. Ooh. So it was not even uh, stable yet, uh, but they were, they were really up for continuous integration and improvements and wanted nice. to be cutting edge. So that was really a huge, uh, 
and cool experience actually. Um, but yeah, we 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 launched it with the 6.2 release candidate too. But it was the server requirements back then wasn't really a big thing. Mm. It, of course, the servers uh, are getting faster and stronger and everything. But I think that the entire setup ran on was it four web servers and two database servers. It wasn't more than that. Wow. Um, nice. And and yeah. And would you end, say it's um? Yeah. Would you say it's fair that the performance bottleneck for those installations is less Typo three, but more the more the data and the databases? Uh, we for sure saw that the database was an issue, mm. or or what to say it was an issue that if you throw hardware at your database server, you right. can get an extremely performant setup. Or, or I guess a CDN, right? Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that too. That we had, of course, too. But but their their hardware, their the database uh, queries were fast. We just by replacing our hardware, we managed to to cut off. I think it was forty five minutes of our deployment time, because the wow. import of the backup was that much faster. We wow. switched from relatively simple database servers to database servers with the yeah, back then it was 46, 64 gigabytes of uh, memory mm -hmm. and 24 CPUs. And it was just like blasting fast. It just nice. And that was the standard. It was not even the database server that Sony bought in back then. It was just the standard web servers that they bought back then. Mm. So, of course, it was also one pretty decent hardware. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was back in 2004. 15 or something like that back. So this is not that far mm. ago, but yeah, in 15, I think 2015 ah. that they did this upgrade and that was really fast. Mm. And that that proved that the communication with the database was in our project, the bottleneck. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let, me, yeah. let me ask you a new question. Yeah. How long have you been involved with the crawler inst extension? Uh, I have been involved uh, since I joined AOE in 2013. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing the main maintenance since 15, I think. Yeah, the extension is developed originally from uh, Kaspers Gorhoi, that okay. also developed Type of Free, together with Dalian Pitchinger from AOE. Mm -hmm. uh, they had some ideas on cache warm up and et cetera. And so it's actually the first release was done in 2005. So it's not that new extension. Right. Um, so it's not my child, so to speak. I, at least I didn't give birth to the child, but I'm nurturing it now. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so explain what it does, and then um, I'd also I'm really curious to know about the sort of um, the workload or the or the processes that go into taking something that's been in the uh, the the system sort of forever and keeping it up to date with the rest of the system. Yeah, uh, we went through or. Yeah, we is the correct word because I got help from outside. Um, went through a really big rewrite, which wasn't really a rewrite, but more a make it compatible change with their type of free 9.5 and 10.4. It started November in 18, I think. And I managed together with uh, with other persons to have it released in together with the 10.4 type of free. So in April this year. Um, and what the crawler does or do is that it er, fills your your cache, so to speak. It ba basically like a search bot. It visits your site. You generate a list of URLs, gets visited, and then what happens on the system is your configuration that decides. So if I visit page A, your page cache for page A will be there. If you have allowed search index on that page, it will be there. If you have um, PDFs, etc., linked there, they will get indexed, so they get into your search index as well. So cache warm up and search for people not using Solar is probably the most common use cases for the crawler. And that's all internal to your installation? That's all internal to my installation, or to uh, their installation, yeah. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's actually from um, uh, purpose point of view, what it does do is actually really limited, but it has uh, potentials. 
or to develop to more. We have one of the latest features we have added is uh, earlier the crawling was just happening first in, first out. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the way you want your cache to be warmed up, so to speak. So many people solved it by doing, OK, then we have uh, a pre-deployment uh, configuration that takes care of the root page, their contact page, and stuff like that, so that they are at least in the cache. Uh, but we have then implemented there so that it combines the information from the CEO optimization mm. because the risk or the risk, the, the, the likelihood that a page that is important to you in your CEO ranking is important to you in your cache is, is quite likely. Yeah. So when the crawler is processing the pages now, they take the one with the highest CEO rankings or not zero rankings but zero priority so uh -huh. that so that the cash gets warm up in their respect to your CEO I, priorities yeah. do i have to set that manually or does it do that automatically it does that automatically and if you don't use the seal feature in type of free every every page had uh, 0.5 as, as priority yeah. uh, and it will go first in first out like it, it always did so if you decide to go and say, okay, my homepage has priority one, uh, my contact is 0 0.9, et cetera, the, these two will always be, be crawled first. Now, does having my highest priority pages pre-cached then improve my search engine ranking because they'll be more performant when the crawlers, the external crawlers hit them? Uh, I have honestly no clue. I don't okay. know. I have all right, through. but it makes them ready for when visitors are coming, right? Exactly. They make okay. sure that the one that is priority to you is there at first. Cool. That's okay. super cool. Regarding the refactoring, we have seen or refactoring making it comp compatible regarding to their to nine and ten version. We have seen that are way too much code for the functionality that it provides mm -hmm. that is custom that is custom written. So some of their initiative that their type of free core is going through right now, I have to go through with the crawl as well. So to replace self-written components with well-known components from the PHP uh, uh, ecosystem. Terrific. Uh, and that's something I'm working on on a regular basis. Um, so that their core functionality of the crawler will of course be custom because you cannot outsource everything to other libraries, but uh, I will make sure that only the logic that belongs in the crawler is in the crawler, and the rest is sub-dependencies. And, uh, and that ties in that ties in with the idea of only doing the interesting work and automating the rest. A little, yeah. <laughs> the, the other thing from a from a business perspective, and um, th this comes up when I'm talking with people about open source um, and and typo three and many other things. Um, you you want to keep as little liability and as little risk in the house as possible. So mm -hmm. if you're maintaining a giant amount of custom code and functionality, you have to maintain the tests, you have to maintain the security, you have to do all of that. And exactly. if there are reliable, de um, dependable, well-tested libraries um, and 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 other sorts of uh, you know external projects that can do it for you. Then spreading that load um, is a is a sensible decision, right? I saw that uh, for the latest version of the crawler that you cut twenty two thousand lines of code out of the code base. Is that, is that roughly right? Oh, I don't remember. I think that was the update from the one being compatible and not compatible with nine. So mm. yeah, that was a lot of code removed. Uh, one of the things we did, we we started using uh, Gussel as an HTTP client instead of right. using the, instead of using the one we have written ourselves. So that's a huge difference. And it's it, so things. many projects wrote HTTP a, a, a messaging all that stuff. Um, yeah. It's great that we can get rid of them. Exactly, and that's the steps I'm going through right now. Um, I I had a really nice workshop uh, last week uh, on refactoring. Uh, with uh, Anna Felina, uh, who is in the PHP world at least really known for that, doing a lot of talks on that. And I had a one-on-one -on -one workshop for hour with her on mm. how to refactor, how to refactor better. Uh, wow. And that and that's, is something that I would, 
as a learning first, take into the crawler, but of course use in my everyday work. And that was really uh, that was really interesting. She's really good at that, and and I have the advantage by by AOE that I have an educational budget, so I used my budget for that this year to do a nice. one -on -one, to do a one on one workshop. The the she calls herself the legacy archaeologist. Exactly. That's, that's really cool. That's really uh, cool. And and that was a really cool workshop, and I learned a lot from it. And there were so many things that you sort of know but don't think about. Mm. And when someone from external uh, inspects and audit your code, oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. And I saw how much I could actually do within a few hours because we actually manage a lot during the workshop itself. Work and you were working on the crawler. We were working on the crawler. She had the crawler. She could do uh, the audit of it. And this, this, and this, and this. And this is just some of the steps that I'm going through right now. Because the smaller and less complex the crawler gets, the easier it gets to replace components, and the easier it gets to develop new features. And even more important, it gets easier to fix bugs. Because yeah. it happens too. So that's the part I'm going right now. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm doing, uh, I have dedicated uh, one evening a week for open source work. Most of it is is crawler. So every Tuesday night, I lock myself in in my room and do at least four hours of open source work. Nice. Although in 2020, there's been a lot of locking yourself in your room time, hasn't there? That's right. <laughs> That's right. But I've also done it before that. <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite feature of Typo3? Hmm. That's a really good question. I I I, I use Type of Free as a end user too for my private project, but I use it more like a standard CMS. To be honest, mm -hmm. I don't use many av advanced features or anything like that. So so I actually find it difficult to answer uh, because I think that ninety nine percent of what I use Type of Free for as a content editor. I yeah. can do with mostly every CMS that I have tried. So is it is it like saying what's your favorite part of your house and you've lived in your house so long that it's it's just like how could you how could you say whether it's the tap or the yeah. or the doorway? I, I, it, it, I don't know if you could put it like that, but it's probably a good analogy because I I, I, I of, there are so many things that I take for granted in type of free. Uh -huh. and, and don't know how to, we don't appreciate them because we get used to the, they're there. All right. So so what is something that everybody should know about Typo three? What do you tell people if you if you're doing doing any of that sort of convincing? Uh, as uh, yeah, convincing. Or I, I like the the new. I like the fact that we get their site handling now and the page uh, regarding their the slots and their so that we are not depending on our speaking URL module anymore from externally. Yeah. That, that is something I find highly valuable because uh, it's something I see belongs in a core. Um, yeah. That, that, that felt strange to me for a long time. Um, and other systems also didn't have it as a core function out of the box for a long time. But um, um, the slug management, making URLs that match for example, patterns that are good for SEO, right? And yeah. titles and and URLs and topics yeah. lining up. That is that's that's that, that's important. Yeah, I find their language handling sometimes difficult, but I find it a really important feature. It also depends on who you pitch it to, what key point selling points that I will I will uh, I will take out because a small uh, sports club or a football club or something like that, they really just need the basic CMS. They they need to see, OK, here here you could build the new forms, which is, by the way, also a really great initiative that it's uh, done easier. Um, here you can do a contact form. So here this is how you do uh, images with text and et cetera, so the basics. And most people would be convinced by that if that's what they need. Of course, doing pictures for a project like uh, this, the Sony uh, PlayStation Network, I didn't do the pitch, but the idea of doing the pitch for them would be more like you have a system that is so modular 
that you can basically extend it to whatever you need. That would be the pitch. So it yeah. really depends on which spectra you're in. And that's also a reason why it's difficult for me to say what is my most important feature, because it really depends on my perspective, because my most important feature as a developer is different as the most important feature as a user. And, and then you're, you, you know, you also have a, a hat on as a community member and contributor and uh, yeah. probably a few others as well. The, 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 the role I take the most is of the, the crawler developer. I try, I've been in the type of free org team doing the extensions on TR since 2013 as well, or 12 perhaps. Um, and that's then my second role. Of course, I have my job, <laughs> but I'm talking about the open source part and not the, the paid yeah. work. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So what do you do? What do you do in the typo three extension repository, the TER? Uh, actually today we have a type of free remote sprint. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also why I could allow myself to schedule it during the normal hours, uh, because I have so many hours after hours today that it would be not, not be a, not be a problem. But uh, today I'm working on that their download numbers in the extension repositories get collected from packages as well. So that we have a ah. total, total downloads number and not That's just- That's really useful. And not and just uh, how many times did it is download from the extension manager, but also right. from packages. Wait, so here's a question I have for you. Yeah. You're gonna put those two numbers together. Yeah. Do you have any sense right now how many people still install out of the repository with the extension manager and how many people install with Composer through Packagist um, yeah. in general? I, I don't have in general, but I can give you a number pretty fast. <laughs> Not in general, but specifically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, one second, sorry for my loud keyboard. It's a uh, geek cred if you have clicky keys. As a, but then I should have, then I can pick out my my clicker here because they are even clickier. Nice. <laughs> I, you have to have something to decide which keyboard you go for, right? From the crawler perspective, we have 114,000 downloads on packages. Yep. And on the extension manager, we have 60,000. So roughly, double as many on packages. And to be honest, packages hasn't been out that long compared to the total time that the extension manager there was there. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a fair comparison to say that it's as two or three do it over packages. I think that the numbers are a little different because uh, actually I could check it more generally, but uh, don't go too much into clicky details right now. But I think that it's 10%. That's my rough estimate. 10% is, is which? It's uh, extension manager still. Right. Okay, because uh, packet you com com using Composer, therefore pulling it from packages, of course, fits with the development trends and standards and 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 CICD of that have become so important and yeah. and widely adopted in the last few years right yeah but i also think it depends uh, of course it always depends but i think it depends on which extension you look at because if you take an extension like the block extension or the news extension that a lot of smaller websites would need as well which let's say a small uh, football club, they will probably not have the same need for, for caching, for, of course, right. caching is nice, etc. But having the first request taking a little longer and then have it cached instead of having it done automatically is probably not the same need, so to speak. But having a new section or a blog post or whatever could be something that also really small sites could benefit from, which probably don't, which could, be the case that they don't have the technicals behind them to set up the site. So they right. click through the extension manager, install the plugin, configure the basic, set up the yeah. template, and done. So sure. it really depends they might not use on... version control. They might not use yeah. they might not do all the all that fancy stuff. Yeah. So it, it really depends on which extension you're looking at, I think. Uh, I, I think that would be at least the the most fair way to 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 look at it because there are extensions that are more developer prone 
and there mm-hmm. is the injections that are more um, end user prone. Yes, yes, for sure. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite open source project? Uh, I, I, oh, as a, I, I would have to say type of free because I, that's the one I use the most. <laughs> I, I, I have used it every day since 2004, I think, uh, in some kind of way. I, I think if, if you, if you forget, sometimes you forget some things when you say, what's your favorite open source? I think when it comes to it, my favorite open source project or projects are Linux, Apache, PHP, stuff like that, because that's the projects that enables me to do what I love with type of free. Nice. So if you put it a little more in perspective, without all these kind of things, type of free would never have been there. Uh huh. For sure. Right. The, and the web as well. So exactly. So, yeah. so I have to, to give a little more credit to, to that. <laughs> so I really care about more people discovering the project and more people trying it out and more people building their careers on it and their companies mm-hmm. and their businesses on it. Um, and I feel very strongly that the project is, is technically in a very strong position and really worth having a look at and very up to date mm-hmm. in terms of development standards. And it's, um, and it has a, a set of capabilities that differentiate it from other legitimate competitors in the market. So different use cases, some of them mm-hmm. I think are absolutely fantastic for type of three. And I think as of late 2020, that not enough people have heard of it. And I really care about spreading the word beyond Central Europe. So can you talk about <laughs> type of three not being a German project and talk about um, like, I don't know, what does it need or what are we doing or what do you want to see so that more people find out about it? What I would like to see is us to go a little more global because we are doing a lot of things. Let me just put it straight in Germany. Uh, because it's a lot of people think it's a German thing only, and you have to have a German development agency or developers attached to be able to even use it. And that is some of the strings that I would like to get rid of. Mm. Uh, and that we can achieve by going more global. I know yeah. we have to go small, but I we need to get started somehow. Which back then when I joined, there was a conference in USA somewhere. Uh, Wasn't that in Dallas? I honestly don't remember. Mm-hmm. I, I never joined it. Uh, I just know there was one. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should start with with going back to the US again. But uh, we see uh, if you're going to the east, uh, the, the, the developers and people behind in, in Nitsan is doing a lot to try to, to yeah. get type of free forward. Uh, there, um, what's it called? Daniel in, uh, in uh, Romania is doing yep. a lot to, to get it through. Uh, put, I don't remember his not, last name. I know the first name is Daniel, but I'll he's doing it. Yeah, something like that. Uh, and he's doing a lot to push it uh, through, uh, not through, but push it f- towards uh, Africa to get uh, less yeah. developed countries to see the benefit from it. Because, of course, open source, you have the big advantages that you have no license curse cost. You can spend every single penny you have on developing what you need. And that uh, might be a feature or that might be people, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that's exciting. I was incredibly yeah. excited when when um, whoever it was figured out that there were typo, like most of the government websites in Rwanda were running on typo three mm-hmm. and that they were outdated. And the, you know, the association and the community organized a two or three trips of people to go down there and do training and enablement and help them get things up to date and secure and then move forward using it. And I they I think that they found another country that's using a bunch of it in Africa. I think that's incredibly exciting. Yeah. Um, and uh, Timek um, Modulewski's yeah. company, Macopedia in Poland is doing great work too. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of think, I kind of think there's a chance to sort of spread it out of Central Europe East on the continent in a very natural way with mm-hmm. those home bases that we have. And the fact that Nitsan has also even run a couple of sprints in India, 
Yeah. Um, the Indian developers that I've met in uh, both uh, the people I've met from Nitsen and the people I've met from other communities are incredibly energetic and incredibly um, um, uh, uh, generous with their contribution. I would really love to see a yeah. strong base come out of there as well. It would yeah. be really exciting. Yeah. But I think that's that's some of the things that we should focus on, uh, seeing how we can uh, get a, a little bigger, uh, small step by step. So so like uh, like in kindergarten when you drew a flower, you started with the center, and then a little uh, mm -hmm. what's it called leaves on it, and then a little more, and then so like your uh, rings in the water start small, yeah. and we have an extremely strong base in Germany. Uh, that would that would be unfair to say differently, uh, but we need to to get a little further. And yeah. some of these initiatives that is going on right now from the the people we just talked about is something where we should help. Uh, and I could see uh, type of free. It shouldn't probably at the first be the core sprints being uh, relocated, so to speak. You cannot contribute necessarily from day one to the core, but. Let's say we go somewhere and we need some front end tasks to be done. We need some some PHP stuff to be done. Then do it in pairing. You don't need to have a person sitting next to you being hundred percent productive, mm. as long as you can uh, transfer a little knowledge and at tick tick tinkle a little interest. Then uh -huh. uh, right. Then then you have won something. You don't. And then also, I guess if you if you enable someone to have a success experience, then they're going to want to come back as well. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. I'm gonna um, um I'm gonna be finding out more about this mentoring program that's going on as yeah. it develops. I'm I'm really I think that's another great opportunity to to find to help people build some careers and and improve their own lives and then they you know some number of them will automatically become champions and and advocates. Yeah, that's that's something I I um, I would like to do myself as well because there uh, there are people on so many levels that need their uh, input or just uh, sparing and dialogue and hey what does it cost me to take a few hours a week talking to some person that would like yeah. some some feedback yeah uh, it, and it's you have you have uh, even if you're modest about it you have really deep long experience and and lots of things that to, to pass on that would help a lot of other people so yeah. it's it's, I think it's one of the easiest ways that we can do do good in the world as as open source practitioners is is make sure that uh, somebody else gets excited about it, right? Yeah, yeah. I am doing uh, a little thing on this podcast called the Suggest a Guest, mm -hmm. and I would like to know in Typo three, but maybe also something near to Typo three or something different. Um, who else should I speak with on this podcast? Who should I invite? Who would you like to hear, get to know better, hear about, show uh, off? I, I I know him really well personally. Uh, so I would probably not be your main listener that day. But uh, I, I like a lot uh, Thomas Liffler. Yeah. Uh, because he has a lot of things to contribute with. He is the dev lead of the Type of Free Org team and has been it f for our, close to as long as I've been in the team. Uh, and he's really good at taking hand on other people and mentoring them and helping them and trying to motivate them. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's doing a lot of contributions in himself, but he's also enabling a lot of people to contribute. And that's yep. something that I think in respect to what we just talked about would be something that people could get motivated about and perhaps interested in because if they see that we have people like this, that yeah. is trying to help and is good at enabling people, they will probably see that the hurdle isn't that big. Mm. Because you, you don't need to start to be a, a full-blown core developer, but if you start to get into Type of Free by doing small commits to the Type of Free org website and you see them go live the next day, <laughs> I'm using an open source project and the main website of that I'm contributing to. That's yeah. cool, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yep, and it's an incredibly powerful, um, uh, a proven psychological effect. As soon as you feel like you own something, 
it you value it much more and the idea that you make up you 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 file a bug report you submit a patch you you do so, uh, create a feature you do something and then you know oh i changed the even if it's like i know i changed the 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 the, the text on that button or i chose you know the frame style or the color or something but you know that it's gone live and you know that it's part of thousands tens of thousands of people's of experience uh da daily experience on the web it's incredible it's uh that contribution drug is a really is a really nice high it is I, i'm not a front-end developer or any kind but i started doing css for for the type of free backend styling in the backend that was uh -huh. my first contributions there you go uh and then at some point i switched over to the to the to the extension repository and yeah yeah so it, it can develop uh, but yeah but the important sure. part is to to get people interested and i think that thomas is a person that is good at that plus not giving it away today but thomas Löffler has my favorite nickname in the whole world so i'm going to <laughs> definitely definitely it's not a secret or anything but i love it so i'm definitely going to bring that up well thank you thank you um for your contributions and thank you for taking the time to talk with me it's really really great to get to know you better thank you for this and and for being part of the community. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I honestly didn't know what to expect as you wrote me. I just like a bit surprised. Yeah, I actually think we have, uh, we, we met once in person. That was uh, at a conference, type of free conference, where you you held a talk and where you did some interviews, doing some, some media things. Uh, but oh, yeah. actually to, uh, talked in person, in person, I think we, we never did. Uh, but I, I I have also suggested you multiple times for, as a keynote speaker because Thanks. I find I uh, find the way you speak and your enthusiasm and it's it's really motivating and I think thank that's you very what, much I think that's what keynotes should be they should be motivations um, uh, so I actually suggested it multiple times when people ask hey who would you suggest and your name is the first coming up most of the times. Um, Gosh. So, so yeah, it's it's not just me giving something. You're also giving a lot, uh, and that's having open source ambassadors is is valuable, regardless yeah. of the stand on system A or system B. Yeah. Ambassadors in general is is good. That's yeah. by the way also one of the things that I've seen lately that with their invention, so to speak, of composer, that they're interactivity switch between the communities are getting bigger because component from Drupal can be used in type of free and vice versa if yeah. they are built correctly. Right. Of and security it. patches can also flow between the projects. Yeah. Um, and I think the other the other equalizer on that front has got to be uh, Symphony, right? People people yeah. picking up the yeah. low level components to um, and then, you know, any work you do there is automatically spread around. That's right. That does, it. but but that's something that has gotten way easier with Composer. Uh, that For wasn't sure. that easy before. Um, so so yeah, that's that's a really big uh, yeah deal breaker, isn't it? Or not, but a uh, big game changer. That was the word. Game changer. Thinking. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm still searching for the words, but it will not be better in German or in English or in Dan <laughs> Danish for that matter. But yeah, that's then when you're so eager to. To speak, you. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Speaking of enthusiasm. Yeah, exactly. I, I always, right. yeah, I always say that I have uh, two hobbies. Uh, one of them I'm fortunate not to live from, and it's unfortunately not golf. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I have my hobby as my job, a type of free and development, and that's that. There are people, of course, that can say they're that fortunate, but. There are also a lot of people who has a job that is just a job. Yeah. So so yeah, but I'm really happy um, about how it, about it, it. It makes life easier if we can combine making a living with finding satisfaction in what we do. That's a huge that's a huge privilege, and I've had that a great deal of the time. I've been involved in software and open source. Yeah, no, I think we're really lucky. So, is golf your job, and 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 work is your hobby? Is that is that how you see it? No, um, <laughs> uh, because then I would not get a pay check every month. Um, <laughs> the actually the fun part is back then when I moved to Germany, I played that much golf that my 
friends was asking me if I moved because of golf or because of my job, because they're, they're, the conditions here is a little better than in the north of Denmark from where I'm from. So it actually would extend my season with about three months a oh, year. The, the weather condition. Yeah. Um, so they actually asked me if it was that it, if that was the reason. But of course, on my level, that's not the reason. That's never the reason. But they thought it was funny to ask it like that. So yeah. Okay, but you better be careful. Um, if you ever move to Italy or somewhere where the weather is really good most of the time, it's going to be really dangerous for you. You know. But I would right. love to be in the south. I've always dreamt of being in Spain and just playing golf. But yeah. You see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that I could never convince my girlfriend about. <laughs> so. It's been so great to spend the time with you. Thank you so much Thank you. For, for this conversation. And let's hope that we get live community events again sometime. It would be it would be great, great to hang out. I would I would say so. Okay. 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 Thanks, Thomas. Yeah. You have a good one. Have fun with sprint. Bye bye. Thanks to the Typo3 Association for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, B13 and Stephanie Kreutzer, for our logo. Shout out to the magnifique Patrick Gaumont, Typo3 developer and musician extraordinaire, for our beautiful theme music. Thanks again to today's guest. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe on the podcast app of your choice and share with your friends and colleagues. If you didn't like it, please share it with your enemies. If you want to suggest a guest for us to have on the podcast, or if you have a question or comment, reach out to us on Twitter at Typo3Podcast. You can find show notes, links, and more information in our posts on typo3.org. Thanks, as always, for contributing. Uh, and then I'll drive one, and then I'll bring you some on my electric bike. I'll come down to mine. See, that's, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll, be I'll, go, I'll just go down. The, I'll go down the Rhine, and I'll, I'll I'll go right there. Yeah, I don't know how well the the bike tracks are uh, along that road, but yeah. Oh, biking on the Rhine is fantastic. It okay. is so 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 nice. That's been my that's been one of my big things this year. Is uh, um. So my pandemic activities have been a lot of bike riding and um, making jams, jellies, and pickles, like stress, therapeutic canning. Uh, I see, I see. I'm also getting more into riding my bike again, and I actually picking up my new bike Monday because I had to order a new, I, I wanted to, no, I had to, I have to do nothing, but I wanted to order a new one. So I, I'm picking it up Monday, so I am ready for the winter. Nice. Because my racing bike is not suitable for winter training. Sure, sure. I have a sort of a, a Dutch bike style, yeah. um, but with a with a small motor on it to to help okay. to help push it along. And it's it's just so much fun. I'm gonna um I'm gonna replace the battery on it and uh, just keep going. Was that the one you picked up beer where the one selling you them said that could be only be one beer on, on them, but you have managed to put two on them? That's correct. <laughs> exactly. <Okay. that. laughs> I, I was not sure if it was you, but I remember something about it. <laughs> yes, also posted that photo. Yep, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs>